37, but we're going to split it because it's quite a long reading. So this first reading, we're just going to read uh, from verses 1 uh, to 23. So if you'd turn that to page 849, or if you've got a large print, it's 1010. Mark chapter 13. So if you remember, we've been in a, a section of Mark's gospel where Jesus has been confronted and confronts the Jewish uh, leaders. A lot of it's been focused in and around the temple. And then we come to chapter 13. Let's listen to these words, God's words to us. And as he, that's Jesus, came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars, and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginnings of the birth pains. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you'll be beaten in synagogues, and you'll stand before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and, the ch and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down, nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who's in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on your guard. I have told you all things beforehand. Amen. We'll continue uh, that reading in a moment. We're going to sing again a song that both declares the amazing grace of, of Christ and also the wonderful hope that we look forward to when he returns. But in those days, after that tribulation... The sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds and from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender 
and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Amen. Now, our passage... Uh, this evening, if you remember, it starts with the disciples leaving the temple. And one of them comments, back in verse 1, Teacher, what wonderful stones, what wonderful buildings. It's a bit like you're walking through the center of Aberdeen. Uh, you're walking along Rosemount Viaduct, let's, uh, let's say with an Aberdeen city councillor. And as you walked along, you, you look up at uh, the art gallery. You, uh, uh, you've crossed the bridge and you see the domes and the, the spires of uh, His Majesty's Theatre, of St. Mark's Church, of the library. And you said, what beautiful buildings, what phenomenal architecture. I love it. And then imagine the councillor said... Yeah, soon it's, it's all going to be rubble. You'd be like, what? What do, you, what do you mean rubble? What's happening? What's going on? And that's what Jesus does. That he says, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. It's all going to become rubble. This giant, magnificent temple will be destroyed. It's shocking. It grabs their attention. Big things are going to happen, Jesus is saying, bigger than you can imagine, and I want you to be prepared. And as he prepares them, he even prepares us all for something greater. Now, this chapter is tricky and, and complicated, and it's tricky because there are two dates in Jesus' calendar that he's talking about. Jesus is literally talking about the building... Oh, sorry, sorry, I missed a sentence. One. One is the destruction of the physical temple in Jerusalem. Okay? And that happened about 40 years later in AD 70. Jesus is literally talking about the building of that temple becoming rubble. He talks about the people in that region, Judea, needing to flee. But he's also got... Secondly, his final return on his mind. And working out which is which is tricky. So, some people argue it's just one, some just the other, and others are uh, both. Now, I believe it's both here, and I hope to show you why and what difference that makes. So what we're going to do is this. Firstly, I'm just going to walk us briefly uh, through this passage, because it's a long passage, and just step by step so we get the flow and then before we get into the detail, I'll just ha explain how we're going to approach this big uh, text. So let me just walk us through. Right, right at the beginning, we get this massive statement from Jesus about the temple being uh, destroyed. And then four of his disciples ask him privately. Do you see that in verse 4? When's it going to happen and what will be the sign? So then, verses 5 to 23... Jesus is talking about the literal Jewish temple being destroyed. Okay, so verses 4 to 13, uh, we see it's labeled there by the SV, signs of the end of the age. He's telling them what life will be like before the temple gets destroyed. And then in verse 14, but when you see... Here Jesus is saying, here is the sign that the temple's going to be destroyed and all that's going to happen that comes with that, the major horrific event. But in verse 24, it, it changes a little. Do you see? It says, but in those days, after that tribulation, 
Jesus is going on to something else. He takes the destruction of the temple and, and turns to something on bigger proportions. It was kind of cosmic language. Did you notice the, the sun's darkened, the stars are falling? About the, uh, and talking about his return, the Son of Man coming. And that it's a significant diversion. But it is a diversion because then in verse 28, he comes back to the original question about Jerusalem. Verse 29, when you see these things taking place, you know that it is here at the very gates. He's back to talking about the temple being destroyed. But to finish, (laughs) see, we're moving in and out. Verse 32, he moves outward again. He speaks of that day, of that hour his return and what it means uh, for us before it happens okay so jesus starts speaking about jerusalem and the temple uh, being destroyed life before and then it happening then this leads to him speaking about his return then he comes back to jerusalem and then he expands out to his return again and life before it happens he's tying these two events these two dates in his calendar together they're distinct but in jesus teaching they need to be held together okay so we we're going to let that help us as we approach this passage okay now what we're going to do as we approach it is is slightly different we're going to actually start in the middle of our passage right in the middle because from verse 14 we get the cataclysmic events in Jerusalem. And then, uh, in verse 24, we get the cataclysmic events of Jesus' return. So we're going to see how they fit together. And then we'll go outwards. So if you're here this morning, David worked concentric circles coming inwards. We're going to go outwards. Um, the beginning of the passage is about waiting for the destruction of the temple, being alert. And the end of the passage is about waiting for Jesus to return and being alert. So we're going to see how they fit together. Okay? Now, if that doesn't make sense yet, hopefully it will by the end. Okay? Uh, but that's just to give us a bit of an outline. Because it is a tricky passage. So, first thing we need to see is this. Christ's return is certain. Christ's return is certain. So remember what Jesus said, the the whole temple is going to be destroyed. And then in verse 4, the disciples ask us, tell us when these things will be and what the sign will be, um, what the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished. And so Jesus begins to answer that, especially this idea of a sign. The first few verses, 5 to 13, he talks about things that are not the sign, just birth pains as he put it. But then verse 14, But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it ought not to be, then. Okay, so here's the sign. There will be a sign, Jesus says, that big things are about to happen in Jerusalem. Now this phrase, abomination of desolation, is a phrase from the book of Daniel. And Daniel is speaking particularly about an event that happened before Jesus was born. A a Syrian king horrifically desecrated the temple. So by, by using this phrase, Jesus is saying something similar is going to happen. Some desecration of the temple. And to say, let the reader understand, Jesus is probably saying, get back to Daniel. Read it carefully and then look about you. It won't be the same as before, but it's in this ballpark. Uh, And when the sign happens, then the destruction of the temple is on its way. And it will be horrific. Did you see that? I mean, Jesus' description is of utter urgency, isn't it? If you see something, something desecrating the temple, get out of Judea. Flee. Run. Don't delay. Don't get a coat. Don't go back uh, into your house. Get going. Get out of there. Such disaster is coming that's never been experienced before. Now, it's not out of God's hands. Jesus says God will cut it short, but even so, it's an event you won't want to be part of. The, the recent uh, I think video footage of refugees fleeing Kiev and Ukraine tragically helps us 
picture what Jesus is talking about. Many in that country would have heard, the Russians are coming, get out. And Jesus is saying, when you see this sign, get out. He's predicting a massive and terrifying event, and it was. The Romans, the war machine of Rome in AD 70, surrounded and then marched into Jerusalem and ransacked it. Josephus, the historian, records that Romans crucified about 500 Jews a day to get the city to surrender. There was extreme famine, people half-starved, and perhaps even a million people died during it. A huge event. Everything that the Jews had known utterly shattered and brought down. And in the midst of it all, perhaps it would have been tempting to think, this is the end of the world. I've never, thankfully, been in that kind of situation. But I wonder, I wonder as you see your home smashed, the, the, the great buildings of power collapsing, bodies strewn in the streets, it must be as close as we can get to feeling like it's the end of the world. Horrific. Jesus wants them to be ready for this, to know it's not the end, verse 21. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. False Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard. Even with all the horrific things that are about to happen, even with people pretending to be the Christ and pretending to be prophets, don't believe the end has come, Jesus is saying. Don't believe I've really returned. Because he's saying my return is on a whole different scale. Verse 24. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. And the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. The fall of the temple, the utter destruction of Jerusalem points beyond itself to a bigger event, a cosmic event, a moment when even the great burning stars in the heavens will collapse. And verse 26, they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. This language is used both of Jesus ascending to glory, but here it seems to suggest as he sits in glory, he's going to return in glory, gathering the elect from all places on the earth. The powerful, magnificent, cataclysmic return of Jesus Christ to earth from heaven. This language is so grand, it's, it's hard to actually picture what it will be like. Jesus returning, the world being made new. We can't really, we just know it's big. No wonder Jesus describes it like stars falling from the sky. But he's saying the great, the great destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, it points beyond to my return. The Romans coming will feel like the end has come, but it hasn't. It's only a shadow, a warning of the greater day. But Jesus isn't just telling some wishful thinking. He wants the disciples and he wants us to see something really important. It's the certainty of what he's just said. Both these events are really going to happen, he's saying. In verse, in verse 28, he goes back to where he started, to the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, back to reading the signs. And he says, just as a branch puts out leaves, so you know the summer is near. Or well, for us, ju just as the daffodils begin to flower, so you know spring is near. Just as you see the temple desecrated, so you know the destruction of Jerusalem is near. It will happen, he's saying. It is certain. Verse 30, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. This is so certain, I can even make a claim that this is going to happen within the life of this generation. Everything uh, could disappear, but the truth of this prediction will stay, Jesus says. And he was right. AD 67, some militant zealots took over the temple. 
They put their own high priest in, usurping the official one. They stained the temple with blood. There was the desecration of the temple, the sign, the abomination of desolation. And then a few years later, enough time for Christians to flee, to escape from Jerusalem, saved by these words of Jesus, the Romans came in their terrifying military might. Jesus' prophecy was certain. And we can see it came true. And so not only was that certain, so must be his final return. If the shadow is real, if the smaller imitation is real, then so will the real thing be. Jesus is utterly in charge. He knew of AD 70. And God was even going to cut it short. And so he knows of his final return, utterly in control of it. It's certain. You know, it's a bit like a, a mathematician saying, well, we know one plus one equals two. That's the first step. But if that is true, then two plus two will equal four. If the temple will be destroyed, one plus one equals two, then the world will face judgment two. Two plus two equals four. It's a certain return of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus said this 2,000 years ago. And as time goes on, perhaps you're getting a little cynical. Really, Jesus? Really? Are you going to return? Feels like the certainty of it all starts to wane. Perhaps... Perhaps we know it's going to happen, like someday we know the sun will blow up, but it's so irrelevant, it just feels so far off, it just fades into the background. Well, if that's you, come back to Jesus' solemn words this evening. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Whose voice will you listen to? The world's? Saying Jesus is just a historical figure, the world will just keep going and going, there's no end, there's no final moment, just on and on. Or will you listen to Jesus, the one who rightly predicted the events of AD 70, and then more than that, rose again after being crucified, the Lord of all. Or perhaps you you do believe in uh, Jesus' return, that he will return, but but things have just got a bit mixed up in, in terms of what's more important, what's bigger And so we lose sight of Christ's majesty. Remember the conversation Jesus is having. The disciples couldn't believe the magnitude of the temple falling. It was a big building, huge stones, and they struggled to see beyond that. And perhaps we're similar. There are some things that just loom so big, we can't see beyond it. You know, imagine being in New York 20 years ago as the Twin Towers collapsed. Something so extraordinary, so terrifying, disorientating. Or for the residents of Kiev at the moment, seeing their apartments and streets brought to nothing. Or just imagine the same happening to Aberdeen, our beloved city laying waste, lying in ashes. And yet, Jesus is saying, these are horrific events. He never belittles pain or suffering. But it's not the same as when I return. These events are just on a different scale. Not just a building will fall, but the whole sun will be darkened. Don't be deceived by it all. Perhaps personal events loom large in your life. Perhaps you worry about a close relative dying or your job. And and these are sad and important things, but don't mix them up with Christ's return. And may that be a, a great reassurance If Jesus' return is so certain, of such power, then what's going on in our lives now isn't out of his control. He's not out of his depth. He's not lost. No, he's in them. Even the shattering of Jerusalem, our God was limiting the horror. His ways are mysterious. Why not ease the suffering completely? We don't know. But he's still in control of them, still caring for his people. See the magnitude of Christ's certain, powerful return. Jesus' return, it's certain. But this, this really begs the question, yes, I get it. I get it's certain, it's coming, but how are we meant to live? How are we meant to live in the meantime? It's such a big question, isn't it? If something this big is going to happen on the horizon, then an event that has cosmic implications, Jesus Christ, a man returning from heaven of all places to transform the whole of creation, 
That's got to make a difference to life now, surely. But what? Well, just notice the repetition. Verse 5, see that no one leads you astray. Verse 9, be on your guard. Verse 23, be on your guard. Verse 33, be on your guard. Keep awake. Verse 35, therefore stay awake. Verse 37, and what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Be alert. Be on your guard. Stay awake. Christ's return is certain. So stay awake. Stay awake. But what does that mean? Now, it can't mean uh, kind of literal never sleep because that would kill us. I mean, it's a metaphor, but for what? Well, here we have to move to the outer sections, okay? Verses 5 to 13 and also verses 32 to 37. Now, in the first, Jesus is talking about waiting for the destruction of Jerusalem. But just think of their experience. Jesus has risen. He's gone to heaven. The disciples have God's mission ahead of them, but they know a big event is on the horizon. And that's just like us now, isn't it? Jesus has risen. He's gone to heaven. We have God's mission ahead of us, and we know a big event is on the horizon, Christ's certain return. And although some of the details might be different, drawing these two passages together will help us. And Jesus' message is stay awake, be on your guard. Now, falling asleep while you're doing something can be quite funny, um, especially for those uh, watching on. Perhaps you've seen a friend falling asleep uh, in a sermon or a lecture on the bus. Perhaps they're doing it even now. Uh, it's the head nod, isn't it? It's, I, I think the backwards head nod's the worst. Like, it, it, it really does. Um, but but other, times, uh, other times, falling asleep can be utterly fatal, can it? Falling asleep while driving, you know, that could be death for you and for others. The call to stay awake there, it's serious. And for Jesus to say stay awake so many times means this matters. This is the serious type. And firstly, it means don't get distracted. Don't get distracted, especially by timings. Verse 5, see that no one leads you astray. And what's the issue? That people will claim the end has come. Um, either people will claim to Jesus returning, verse 6, many will come in my name saying, I am he. But don't get distracted. Or life in the world will feel like it's moving to something big. Verse 7, when you hear wars, rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There'll be earthquakes in various places, there'll be famines, but these are but the beginnings of the birth pains. Sometimes it can feel as if the world is in a particularly bad way. Everything seems to be going wrong, and I know this has been true for some of us over the past few years. Is, you know, COVID, global warming, Ukraine, moral decline in marriage and schools, severe storms, Australian forest fires. We, we, we start to think, is this it? Is this everything about to change? Is Christ returning now? But Jesus is saying, don't get distracted. Suffering will continue. There will continue to be wars and famine and earthquakes. Yes, they're serious. But they're just the beginning of birth pains. In other words, bad things don't tell us anything about when Jesus will return. They're part of this world. They'll come and go. They'll be around in every generation. I think the temptation for us is we can get all doom and gloom. The, the, the world is just going to get worse and worse. We see the endless stream of bad news day after day after day. And so we, we stop caring about it. We give up on being agents of love and hope. It all just feels too much. What's going on in the world distracts us from our mission. And this, for some, can get extreme. Some people at this point will try and persuade you to stop what you're doing and just focus on the end, saying, I am he, I'm Jesus. There have been countless cults that have predicted the end of the world. You know, people have gone off into some hidden place to await Jesus' return. Just think of David Koresh in Waco back in the 1990s. Him claiming he was the Lamb of God. And it ended in disaster, complete fraud. But Jesus is clear. If we go to the end of our passage, verse 32, 
but concerning that day or hour, no one knows. Verse 33, you do not know when the time will come. Verse 35, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come. Verse 36, lest he come suddenly. So stay awake. Don't get distracted by timings. Instead, staying awake, it means perseverance. Perseverance in persecution. We all know that, that, that feeling of trying to stay awake for something important, don't we? It can, be, it can be hard work to stay awake sometimes when it matters. You know, you're, you're near the end of a long day or you're, you're, you're waiting for an important phone call or your, your boss is talking to you about something important at the end of a long week. It's hard work and, and time can really feel like it slows down. It can feel like an endurance race. It's hard, and that's exactly what Jesus wants us to do, to endure. To endure, verse 13. The one who endures to the end will be saved. Stay awake, endure, persevere. And this is particularly in the face of persecution. Verse 9, be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, you'll be beaten in synagogues, you'll stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. He says, you'll be hated for all, uh, by all for my name's sake. As persecution heats up, Jesus says, stay awake. Don't slide into a stupor. The gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. We have a mission. We have a gospel to declare. A gospel for all, for your, your neighbor, for your workplace, for Aberdeen and Peterhead, for Wales, Slovenia, Finland and Russia, for Israel, Saudi Arabia, for Indonesia and Fiji, for Colombia and Uruguay. Stay awake. Persecution will try and squash the gospel. Persecution will try and get us to keep our mouths shut on the transforming news of Jesus Christ. It's fine for you, but don't you dare let it be shared in the public place. Not in our schools, not on Facebook. And we can start to believe that the world will just be better off if we just stay quiet. If the gospel was just turned down a bit, made a bit more palatable, a bit nice, let's repent and believe. And we slowly drift off to sleep. But stay awake, persevere in persecution. Jesus has sent his spirit to get the gospel out. He's empowering the evangelization of the world. Keep with the agenda. Stay awake. It's not a sprint, but a marathon. We patiently endure. We don't get distracted. We persevere in persecution. And so lastly, we keep following Christ. We keep following Christ. In verse 34, Jesus tells his disciples a parable. A man who, who owns a tidy estate, he, he heads off and <coughs> leaves his home with servants in charge. Okay? Each uh, have got their work to do. One's, I know, got some cleaning to do. The other to sort the accounts. The other uh, to prepare the food order. And while he's away, they stay awake. They get on with what he's left them to do. They don't huddle around in a group counting the minutes. They don't... Uh, get distracted, have a pint and play board games. They just get on with it. Remember what uh, Jesus has been teaching them. What we saw last week, the Christian life is one of wholehearted love and sacrifice. It's loving God and loving others in the world he's made. It's, it's giving our money, our time, our lives sacrificially for others. It's enjoying God, our Heavenly Father. N knowing Christ will come back means we keep following Christ. We stick with the task he set us. Wholehearted love and sacrifice. Now John Wesley, back in the day, was once asked, how would you spend tomorrow if you know Jesus was going to return in the evening? And he did this. He took out his diary. He read the list of engagements he had for the following day. And he said, these are the things I would do tomorrow if I knew the Lord was returning then. That's a man who's awake, isn't it? Knowing Jesus might return uh, means two things. It means, we, one, we, we'll use our time well. We use it to do the tasks Christ has given us. We've been given the gift of time and resources. Let's use them. Use them to bring life and to love, to, to know our Heavenly Father better, to worship Him, to, to share Christ with others and bring joy. 
to work well with our hands, to celebrate good things, to, to grieve pain and loss, to do life well. So what's in your diary? Are they these things? Or have you fallen asleep? Is it, is it self-centered, flitting away the hours in a sleepwalk? Stay awake. Keep following Christ. And on the flip side, Jesus' imminent return means we don't just get paralyzed by the thought of it, okay? We don't only do the ultra-spiritual tasks. We're humans, okay? We still need to wash and eat. We need to do the dishes and buy clothes and change nappies and get the bus and have a holiday. We keep following Christ with our whole lives. We stay awake. We keep Christ's law in view. What he says is important. We do life like him. Keep following him step by step in wholehearted love. That's what staying awake looks like. Christ's return is certain, but, but its timing is unknown. So if you're not a Christian here this evening, this really matters. If the world isn't just heading on merrily for er- forever, if there's an end in sight, Jesus' return, then are you ready for him? He will return to save his people and to judge those who've rejected him. Just as he judged the religious leaders in the last few chapters of Mark's gospel, so he will judge all. Come to him now. Come to him this evening. Seek his gracious hand of forgiveness. You will not regret it. So to us all, stay awake. Don't get distracted. Persevere in persecution. And keep following Christ. Amen.